today's first panelist is Barbara Marbach. She's a team leader of our educational advocacy specialist here at Westside Regional Center. So thank you, Barbara, for joining. Thank you, Sandy. Wait, there we go. Okay. Well, welcome. And this uh, presentation is going to um, address this big transition, right, from early intervention services to the initial IEP, which is you're moving from one legal framework to another legal framework. And we'll talk about that in more detail. So at the transition conference, you probably have met with your district rep. You sign consents from the school to conduct assessments to determine child special needs, what the eligibility framework would be. Um, the school district should provide you a little bit of an overview of the process of the assessment process. And nothing will start unless until you sign that uh, assessment, uh, assessment plan. So the timeline, you're, you're talking about transition and early start. You're going to be moving from a framework of uh, individual family service plan or IFSP um, to uh, a, the IEP. You should discuss your vision of how, what you see your child doing for these preschool ages from three to five. Um, you'll talk about what assessments will be done your regional center provider or service provider should have a lot of assessment information and it would be important for you to share that as well. There's a um, timeline for assessments in regards to the Individual Disability Education Act that the IEP framework is, is under. You have um, 15 days to consider the assessment plan um, once you sign the assessment plan, it starts a timeline of 60 days. So in other words, once you sign that consent to assess, you should be sitting down at an IEP meeting uh, within 60 days, not counting school vacation or off time. In this COVID time, um, the timelines are being held to, it's just looking a little different and we'll talk more about that later. Once you have an IEP and you signed an agreement, it should be implemented immediately. And then they're reviewed, IEPs are reviewed um, once every year, unless something significantly changes, your child has medical issues, you're moving something, you can call an IEP. Um, it's better to do that, send an email. Once you send an email to the requesting an IEP, the school district contract, uh, contractor has 30 days to respond with an IEP date. Okay, so this is the big shift, the difference between early intervention and special education program. It can be a little confusing, so I'd like to kind of share how they're alike. So they both work with parents and they both are individual services. Um, and as you're familiar with, the IFSP, Individual Family Service Plan, is the Early Start Framework. The Special Education Framework is the IEP. Both provide individualized services for your child, and both have trained staff and specialists that work with children. Both have a team collaborative approach. How they're different, as you can see, Early intervention services are in the natural environment. You know, they could be provided at home, on the playground, at daycare, where basically where your, your child is. They are individualized. And it's typically a one to two times a week per service. And it's requested and required that the parent be present during services. Special education's a big shift. It's in a preschool classroom. So there will be other children there. Most services are provided in groups. There are um, situations when you have related services that call for individualized um, intervention. And we'll talk more about that later on. Preschool services there, and they're usually five times a week or three times a week. It depends on the program that your child is eligible for. And we like parents to collaborate 
but not necessarily be present during services. Most practitioners feel it's important to collaborate and talk with the parents, but during intervention, it can be a great distraction for the student. Another way they're different is early start, as you know, is developmentally based. So we look at skills developing and uh, walking, reaching, rolling, thinking, communication, self-help, emotional, but they're all based on where the child's at. Special education services are educationally made. What does it, a much more limited perspective. What does a ch child need to access the preschool curriculum? So it would be helpful to be familiar with the preschool curriculum. Okay. They're also different than what we have for early intervention is IFSP. And for special education, it's an IEP. It's a, a, a contract to deliver services. Um, if your child is over three and will stay with regional center, has enough of a need to be uh, stay with regional center, there'll be another document that will be developed through the regional center, specifically for regional center services, and that's called the IPP. Okay, so the law of the framework for the IEP is the uh, Special Education Individuals with Visibility Education Act, IDEA. When a child moves forward from uh, early intervention to special ed, she's going to receive, may or may not receive the same services. The time and frequency may be reduced. Uh, preschool, as we talked about, is very language-based and social skills focused, so some of those specific skills will be decreased or at least addressed in the classroom environment. The child no longer qualifies for the service. Um, if assessment determines that your child is not eligible or doesn't have a level of need to request or to benefit from speech services or OT services, you have a right to disagree with that assessment and ask for an independent education evaluation. And we'll, we'll go in more into detail later on. If you are going to request an IEE, you have to make sure, you just can't say, oh, I don't like that report. You have to really document why, what the report was missing and why you're making that request for the IEE. So special education is an umbrella of services. It's not a specific place. It's designed specifically for your, stu your student with no cost to you. The goals, the assessment information, the strengths, the needs, the present level of performance, the goals in the classroom placement is written into the IEP. Again, it's a contract for service delivery. It's not that once it's signed, it's a contract for service delivery but not necessarily a guarantee for success. Um, and that's where the assessment information, we'll talk more about that. That's where you as a parent can provide a lot of information that will lead to success. It includes the related services. Sometimes they're called designated instructional services. These related services could be speech, OT, physical therapy, uh, AAC, um, vision therapy, deaf and hard of hearing, it all depends on what the student's needs are. And it's all under the framework of the Individuals with Disability Education Act. Idea. So there's six main principles of IDEA for us to consider. First is that, and you'll hear this um, term a lot, so I want you to become familiar with it. Your student has a right to a free and appropriate public education. That acronym is FAPE. That term is used a lot in IEP meetings. So I want you to make sure that you understand what that is and we'll go into more detail. You have the right to be educated in the least restrictive environment. That it means, the law actually says, alongside non-disabled peers with the supports and services in place in order to get education benefit. So being educated in the general ed classroom, that's the least restrictive environment framework of the IEP. 
Do you have the right to appropriate evaluations or assessments? Do you have an individual education program, an IEP that documents what's going on uh, so everybody knows what um, goals are being worked on, what the child is learning, and so we can um, see measurement. Um, it's parent and student participation in the decision process. Of course, your student is probably not going to be participating too much, other than uh, maybe having a very, very difficult time that will get to your attention that will call you to have a IEP meeting. And if there's areas, if you disagree, uh, there's a framework, a due process and procedural safeguard framework, and we'll, we'll go into that in more detail later. So a right to a free and appropriate education FAPE in the least restrictive environment based on appropriate and free assessments documented in an IEP document with your participation. And if you disagree, there's a framework uh, for disagreeing to get resolution. Okay, the IEP process. We talked about assessments briefly. You could tell me about this now, right? No, okay. So, you have the plan to consider, you want to review it and sign it, uh, 15 days, don't take longer than 15 days to review the plan. You want to sign it, when you sign it, you want to keep a copy of that uh, assessment plan that you signed, that starts the 60 day timeline. IEP is held and after you sign it, it's implemented and it's reviewed at least annually, but could be more often if the need calls for it. So a little bit more about assessments or evaluations. They help determine if the child is eligible for special education services and what services are needed to access the curriculum. So it's kind of, especially for your initial IEP, there's two frameworks. How are you going to be eligible for special education? Some districts have sort of um, a generic eligibility call, call, uh, uh, category called um, developmentally delayed, but some districts don't. So it could be that if your child and the assessment information determines that your child has autistic-like behaviors, it could be an eligibility of autism. It could be an eligibility of intellectual disability. It could be an uh, eligibility of um, uh, specific learning disability. But you'll have time to discuss this um, when we're in the IEP meeting. The, there, should, there should be multiple assessments to use to determine eligibility, just not one person's opinion. Um, and you, the child must be assessed in all areas of disability, suspected disability. The assessment plan that you have 15 days to consider will tell you what assessments will be used and who the examiner or the assessor is. And again, if you feel like the assessment is not capturing your child at all, you would bring that to the attention of what they missed and you can request an independent education evaluation, IEE. And, um, We'll talk about that. There must be ongoing assessment. So there's an initial assessment in terms of eligibility. Um, yes, you're eligible for special education. Then the IEP goals you write, those are looked on as ongoing assessments too. So once ago, you write a goal for a year and then they're looked at, uh, broken down every three months, four months, in smaller increments to look at, see if your uh, child is making progress. Um, there are also a typical preschool, a typical school has um, report, report card periods. Usually every five or six weeks, you should be getting an update as well based on the IEP. Not a new IEP, just progress on the goals. The assessment um, process that's used for age three to five is called a desired results developmental profile. You can see the um, link at the bottom of the slide, give you more information. 
that basically this is the um, uh, desired results developmental profile. It's what's used for every child, every preschool child in a preschool program, not necessarily a student with special needs. So it documents progress in the areas of learning, getting along with other, being safe, healthy. It's based on observations of your child and a typical everyday activities with familiar people. Special education service provider or speecher, the teacher or the OT can actually do the assessment. Your child's teachers may be asked to share observation if your child is in a typical preschool now and you've just become eligible for special education. Your child's teacher could write a letter or share observations on how your child is doing in that environment. And among typical preschoolers, the desired results developmental profile are done two times a year, fall and spring, on all children in public school ages three to five. It also includes a family survey that teachers use to ensure families' needs are being met. And again, this can get in detail. There's some detail in the appendix of this presentation, and you can get in-depth detail from signing on to um, the desired results access.org. Okay, well, the IEP is really an opportunity to uh, collaborate with your school team and teacher, get to know them. Um, it's an opportunity for you to provide input into the design of the IEP. You can share your special perceptions, you know, where you see your child going, what's important to you and your child as a family and work creatively with your teacher and providers. You do have, as parents, um, responsibilities. You have to develop, or you should, it would be in your best interest, to develop a partnership with the school and the providers. Um, ask for an explanation of anything of the process or plan that you don't understand. You want to make sure the goals are specific and related to what your child's needs are. You want to make sure that your child as part of their program is included with same age peers as much as appropriate. You want to make sure you're monitoring the child's progress. You can do this by collaborating with your providers or your teachers, but I would recommend that you set up a time to talk with them either by phone or meeting. Don't assume that you can have five minutes of their service delivery time with your student to um, uh, talk with you. If you have big issues other than, you know, if you have big concerns or big issues or you need clarification on an issue, ask for a time when you can have a phone call or an email or, or meet. Just don't assume you can do it during their student's therapy time. You want to try to resolve issues directly with the school providers. Don't let things um, get out of hand or get really blown up. Try to uh, uh, work directly with the providers. Um, if, a, uh, if a phone call or um, uh, discussion doesn't seem to address your needs, then you can start um, documenting and ask questions in an email, and that way you'll have um, documents, uh, documentation if, if you need to for the next step. You want to make sure you keep your educational and re relevant, relevant medical records together. We highly recommend to use a, a three-ring notebook have indexes, put the medical information in one, put the school information in another, so that's right and available and easy to use. And you want to uh, participate in support groups and uh, connect with other parents. So you have, uh, those were your responsibilities. Here are your rights. You have your right to participate. You have the right to get prior notice, that means they need to inform you, the school district education agency needs to inform you of what they're going to do, um, make any changes, but they can't make any changes without your consent. Or you can refuse consent and go to a meeting and discuss it. You have a right to non-discriminatory assessments. Your child can be assessed in the, uh, their, their own language. You have a right to receive IEEs, as we talked about. 
and to access educational records. You can bring a friend or someone to support, a, a support person. You know, I'll just do a little bit about our education support services. This is the role that we have specifically is to assist families with I, IEP process. So you can bring um, someone to help you for support uh, to the meeting. You have a right to have copies of the IEP and all the assessments and reports at no cost and have the IEP implemented as soon as possible after it's signed by you in agreement. You can have the IEP scheduled at a mutually agree upon time. You don't have to take, oh, 7 a.m. I can only offer you 7 a.m. because the teacher has to uh, teach the rest of the class. You have a right to have the IEP scheduled at a time that, that works for you, that's, that's reasonable. You have a right to have an uh, independent language or sign uh, interpreter or translator interpreter available for you if needed. And you do an annual review of the IEP. Um, if certain circumstances change, you can have an IEP sooner than a year. And then you have a right to due process if things don't, um, if you're in disagreement with something. Preparation for the IEP meeting does not have to be difficult or time consuming. <laughs> Even though um, it usually is, we're helping you, so this could go um, a little smoother, but seeing that this is your first IEP, you know, there's a, there's a lot of emotionality attached to it. And sometimes families feel like their, their whole um, family is under a microscope, so don't, get over concerned, that's sort of a typical feeling, and that's what we're about today to help you prepare for it. So you can do it. So you want to keep, create, and keep up to date the binder we talked about that contains all of your child's records. So you want to uh, categorize by assessment, communication logs that you're, you're having with your teacher and provider, um, uh, educationally related medical information. I mean, it's obvious if your child has more significant medical challenges, a G tube or a trach or um, uh, allergies or um, a seizure disorder medication regimes, that can all be talked about and shared and developed in a healthcare plan as part of the IEP. You have the right to have progress reports. So you have read the reports and CAPS. The other thing I want to really highlight is when you're exiting your early start framework, your early intervention framework, you're going to receive summary reports from your providers. It's very important that you get familiar and read those reports. They have a lot of information that can be translated into the special education arena. And if you are in a place where you have time and you've developed a collaborative rapport with your provider, you can ask for a time to sit down and, and, and have them maybe suggest some draft goals that you can consider and present to the team. So use your providers while, while you have them, but be respectful of their time and uh, be a good collaborator. And then you can pre prepare your own uh, parent report, and we'll talk more about that. So you want, just as I said, you want to know what services are being provided now under early intervention and what the goals are and how can these goals be translated into academic goals. So the first thing, uh, when you get contacted by your school district assessor, you want to tell them right at that time that you are requesting copies of assessments prior to the IEP meeting. Also, remember we talked about the assessment plan that you're going to sign and give consent. You can write an asterisk in the bottom where your signature is and say, I request copies of the assessments four days prior to the IEP. Legally, the district has four days to give them to you prior to the IEP. It's really important to be able to look at the assessments prior to the IEP for a couple of reasons. One, the meeting won't take so long because you're not going to be reviewing the assessments in the meeting. You'll be somewhat familiar. You can do summaries. 
and two, it's not, you'll have a big picture of, of what's going on. So everything won't be a shock when you hear it for the first time. Okay. You want to make sure you bring someone with you, someone just to take notes or someone for moral support, someone that can uh, hear what's being said as well. You can also audio tape the IEP. But to do that, you have to give 24 hour notice in writing. So when you sign your assessment plan, you can write on there too that you intend to audio tape the IEP. If you forgot to do that and you're talking about setting up the IEP a couple of days before, you know, via email, you would you could do that in email saying that you intend to audio record the IEP. Okay, we're preparing for the meeting. Find out who, what professionals are expected to participate. Uh, your teacher or program ma uh, manager can share this with you. A professional is not required to attend the IEP meeting if that area, member's area of curriculum or expertise is not being modified dis or discussed at the meeting. The parent and the school district need to agree. So in other words, if you have a child um, that uh, does not have any physical needs or any physical therapy needs, there won't be a physical therapy uh, person at the IEP. There won't be a physical therapy assessment other than the, the generic one for eligibility that says there are no needs in that area. However, an IEP team may excuse uh, a professional from attending the meeting when the meeting involves modifications or a discussion of the member area of a curriculum or related services. If the member, that professional, submits in writing an input into the development of the IEP prior to the meeting. And you would typically talk with, with the person. So if the peace person has two other meetings, you talk with her before you send emails, you're familiar with the goals that they're gonna be uh, um, suggesting, you can write an excusal letter for that person to be excused. You can, you don't have to. If you feel like, oh, what we talked about on the phone wasn't enough or I really don't understand or something new came up, I would like that person at the meeting, that would be your job to share it with your, your teacher or the uh, program manager. The other thing that could be helpful is for you to think of goals for your child. Um, it's, you, you would be pretty familiar by now, I would think, in terms of reading your assessment information and being prepared for the meeting. So that should stimulate some ideas that you wanna make sure you discuss. And here's just a little sample of what that could look like. So, it's your report for your student. What are your concerns for this particular um, student, Smith? The following directions, of social interactions, behavior stress associated with stress at school are real big concerns. Um, one of the things in terms of following directions would be, let's make sure we have eye contact. You can write a goal for eye contact. You can write a goal for participating in a playground game or participating with, in a group of three. You can write a behavior goal around controlling outbursts and that would be part of the IEP under a behavior intervention plan, which would talk about the antecedents um, and the function of the behavior and the consequence. We'll go more. So remember, you're the expert. You're not handing over the whole plate to a teacher. You're an important team member. Yeah, you might not know the terminology. It might be all new, but you know what your, your child and you know what your child can and can't do and what you want your child to learn to do. And those are all things that you should share in the meeting. You, uh, and again, this is a business meeting. So you want to address as, professionally, you want to um, communicate professionally, you want to be respectful and um, listen to someone, don't interrupt. Um, I'll talk about this later. And uh, a good icebreaker and especially some of these IEP team, um, initial IEP team folks are doing, you know, two, three meetings, four meetings a day. So snacks are 
are um, extremely welcome. Not required, but uh, uh, an addition that's um, really appreciated. Okay, so team members might write drafts of goals prior to the meeting. You are not required to accept the goals that you had no part developing. However, if they're really good goals and you see how they would work, or if you want to say only, oh, I think they need physical prompts instead of verbal prompts, you can share that information. So if someone walks down a goal without discussion, oh, here are my goals, you can say, oh, can we talk about these a little bit, please? Can you help me understand what you mean? So those are your questions. If the district does not want to include something on uh, what you're requesting, ask them why. Can you clarify? Why, why are you refusing this? Why is it unnecessary? Um, I usually um, review things three times. So what you're saying, let me, do I understand you're saying X, Y, Z? Or, oh, I'm, could you help clarify? I, I, so what you mean is, you know, ask these kind of questions after, I kind of visit this around three times and if you don't get any movement or they're just staying with their staying, well then you know you have an issue uh, to move forward with um, when you're at the place when you're, we're talking about due process. So the other thing that would be helpful is why put that refusal in writing. Um, and then that, that again, you can be uh, take detailed notes of the conversation and you can discuss and that can be a point of disagreement. So the framework goes, you review the assessment information. From the assessment information, present level of performance, or the acronym for that is PLOPS, are developed. The strengths are pulled from assessment, the needs are pulled from the assessment, and that's translated to the IEP document. Then the goals and objectives are completed or written based on what that present level of performance is. Oops. So if you disagree with the school district, you may write a, a statement and attach it to the IEP. There's a, a signature on parent consent page specifically for this. This is a consent page where you check, I received the information um, and I agree with the IEP. I agree with parts of the IEP or I disagree with the entire IEP. So you can, um, uh, agree with components. The speech looks great. I want to continue with that, with the recommend recommendations. However, I feel the assessment for eligibility was did not capture all the needs, so I'm disagreeing with eligibility or I'm disagreeing with OT because you didn't really agree with all, um, capture all these things. So you can agree to the parts of the IEP and disagree with parts. So you don't, <clears throat> the district nor you can bring up the issue of budget. Sorry, your child would be eligible. We just don't have the money. That's not an appropriate answer. And that's um, a disagreement right there. Um, <clears throat> you want to, we highly recommend that you take the IEP home and consider it. Um, so much happens at the IEP meeting, especially your first one, it's hard to kind of keep track and remember and what did we agree on? Oh, I forgot about that. So take the, and then there's a lot of discussions, people you know, talking and nodding heads that you think are, oh, that's an agreement. And then you look at the document and it's not recorded in the document. So it's very important. Take it home before signing, review it with your, your partner. However, you should return it within a week. If you don't like the IEP and you don't sign in disagreement uh, and you don't sign the IEP at all, even in disagreement, nothing will happen. Your child will not start a program, special ed program. So you have to sign specifically in agreement or specifically in disagreement and move on to next step. But just saying, I'll show them I won't sign the document. It's not going to serve you or your child at all. So we want you to ask questions, but it's important to understand 
the, the framework, so the circular issue around this. So what question, the question, the what question is, what is recommended? What service, what intervention, what's recommended? Why is it recommended? Because the difficulty with um, sensory motor issues for OET. Okay, so what's the goal? The goal should be specific, should contain the frequency, uh, what the child's going to learn, the frequency and duration should all be part of the goal. What service, what is the intervention going to look like? So is it going to be two times a week for 30 minutes? Is it going to be once 120 minutes a month? So we want to look at where, what that intervention will look like, the services. Who's going to provide it? When will it be provided? Where and how will it be provided? and how will I know it's effective? So these are all the things, questions, I want you sh to consider when you're moving forward with your IEP. So now we're at the components of an IEP for a preschooler. So one of the requirements is eligibility. We talked a little bit about this. This is the initial assessment that the school district would do, it's called a psychoeducational assessment. It looks at the child in terms of big picture, what are their strengths, what are their needs, what are they able to do, and based on all that information, they're eligible for special education because they have an intellectual disability. They're eligible for special education because they have autism. They're eligible for special education because they have or a specific learning need. So it would be an eligibility category. Uh, and there's, there's several of them. It could be um, multiple disabilities. Maybe you have uh, several health issues going on with your child or some um, physical or orthopedic needs. So there's uh, eligibility for um, multiple disabilities, orthopedic. So there's a lot of eligibility. So that needs to be the first thing on the document. How are we eligible? Then we talked about this in terms of present level performance or PLOPs. Remember the PLOP? So we should have a present level performance in each of the areas. Reading, writing, math, communication, gross and fine motor development, social and behavioral, pre-vocational, and living skills. So the questions you would want to consider is how does my child disability affect her involvement and progress in the general ed curriculum? What are the plots based on current information? So are the uh, present level performance using current assessment information, not something that's three years old? Um, the district every three years does comprehensive assessments. Okay, so the, the plot should be based on, on accurate current information of your child. Do the assessments sort of ring true? Do they correspond to what my knowledge base of my child's ability is? Do they talk about the child's abilities or strengths as well as area of need? You need to have that uh, perspective of the child's capacities and areas of need. Is, it, is the IEP addressing my concerns? Um, uh, does the team acknowledge? Uh, there's a part of an IEP that if it doesn't fit into goals and objectives of assessment, uh, there's a part of the IEP called the discussion page. And so some of those questions or uh, areas can be documented in the discussion page, which is at the end of the document. Has, is the student, is the, your team familiar with your student? Have they know what the assessment information is, what the strengths and style are, and has your input been considered? Who's going to be responsible for doing the assessments? Remember for preschool, it's the desired results, developmental profile. So is it the speech person? Is it the teacher? Who's going to be doing this assessment? And when will I see the results? Then the next thing is they're going to be annual goals, specific goals. The goals are based on the assessment information of my child's present level performance, our 
positive behavior supports needed and included. So with prompting, um, uh, you would, that would be reflected in the goal. Do they re reflect who my child is? Are the goals appropriate? Um, I've encountered some situations in the past where um, the, there was actually a mistake and the teacher was sharing this great assessment information, but it wasn't the student that was there at the meeting. So that does, that does happen. Um, how will the uh, progress be measured? And will they really address the short-term goals? Will they address the progress? And how, how will I be able to tell if my child has mastered uh, the goal or the benchmark? So in the meeting, these are the questions that you can ask. Someone have a question? Okay. Well, um, other questions to ask in the IEP is what services supports, including the related services are going to be provided. We talked about this when, where, how, with whom, how long, how, how often. What makes the placement appropriate for your child? This is the FAPE offer. Remember free and appropriate, it includes placement, services, frequency, um, duration, any uh, uh, accommodations, supplementary aids, any accommodations or modifications, and if your child is eligible for summer school, and if your child will need transportation services. So in the, in the case where you have an IEP, you wrote your annual goals. Oh, let me finish this part first, okay. How much this is an important part of the least restrictive environment? What percentage of the day will your child be included with typically developing children? And what does that look like? So most schools, well, of course for preschool it's a little different, but just saying recess or um, nutrition time and having a child with social difficulty in with typical peers at typical recess time but if they're off in the corner, you know, picking up leaves and eating leaves, that's not an appropriate peer interaction. So if that's happening, you can have an IEP and ask for uh, support, intervention, support that your child would have during those unstructured times to help facilitate a conversation or help to play appropriately. Okay. Does your child need mental health services and are they included in the IEP? And again, for preschoolers, how, how will I, and how and when will I be informed of my child's progress? So you, you should tell me right now because we reviewed this, but you would be reviewing it um, every three months in terms of those goals. You can also sit down and ask for, um, a collaboration meeting with the teacher, or there's probably parent night where you can uh, talk with the teacher specifically about child's progress. And what will be done to support my child to transition to kindergarten or special education, general education? So the transition. Oftentimes, if we're talking about transitioning a student into a general ed setting once they've been in more self-contained, that can be something that you can write on the IEP that you do for a period of a time, like you start for an hour a day and over time to build up capacity, you can increase it uh, by 15 minutes or 20, whatever is appropriate. So know that you can do systematic transitions. However, if you're five and you're tr transitioning to kindergarten, as I talked about before, uh, comprehensive assessments will be done. They will be academic assessments. They won't be from the realm of um, desired results developmental pro, uh, profile. They will be more specifically uh, special education academic assessments. They'll look different because at K you're accessing the core curriculum. There's two types of curriculum once you're in typical school. Um, from kindergarten on, there's what we call the core curriculum. This is the uh, core curriculum content, academic content, 
that leads to a diploma once the student is in high school. There's an alternative curriculum, and this is based more on functional learning skills in a functional context. And a student on this curriculum and stay on this curriculum is eligible for special education services until age 22. Those last two, uh, from 19 to 22, specifically focuses on uh, trans, trans, uh, transition skills, work skills, vocational skills, life skills. So that's, that's a big, big difference in the curriculum. So assistive technology now, there's a lot around assistive technology uh, these days. It's called alternative augmentative communication. Um, there's some uh, software, there might be a tablet or um, that your child, if your child is not verbal, but they can point to um, icons or pictures to communicate. Assistive technology, most programs start with the student pointing to pictures, icons. If they can point to a field of two icons to say, to agree, to make a request, to ask to go to a drink or go to the restroom, if they're using picture icons, then that can be translated into a software program and using a, a, a tablet. There's a lot of applications out there. That's under the realm of an AAC, assistive, uh, alternative, augmentative. <laughs> okay, I think I've been talking too much already. So alternative augmentative communication assessment or AAC. If your child's an uh, English learner, the IEP needs to be me me measured, right? If so, um, some of the assessments could be in the child's original language, so you get a really true idea. They should be supported in terms of learning another language and they should understand what, what's going on, you as a parent as well. If there's behaviors that impede the learning of the child, they can have a specific part of the IEP called a behavior intervention plan. There's a specific assessment that's called a functional behavior assessment that focus specifically on the behavior, the um, antecedents, um, the consequence, and uh, the behavior. Again, you need if you need to follow someone, follow up with someone on the team, do you have their contact information? You want to make sure you have that. You want to, if you disagree with any parts of the IEP, I would have a little written statement on why you're disagreeing with that. And again, take the IEP home and consider it before you're signing. Okay, we talked about this in terms of goals. So, goals are specific. Um, they're measurable. So they have to be what specifically behavior am I increasing, decreasing? How are we going to measure it? Going to make sure it's attainable going to make sure it's relevant. We don't want to work for a whole year on something that's not important and can be accomplished in a year. There are about things we want to do, get, become. So it's a verb. We want the goals that are uh, statements that will tell and articulate the skills, either academic or behavior, that the teacher and student are aiming for. So in terms of the least restrictive environment, remember we talked about this. I want to review this pyramid with you, okay? So the pyramid is general ed, least restrictive environment. You're in a regular education classroom, okay? Then the next could be, the next level of support or LRE would be I'm in general ed class, but I'm getting supplemental support. Maybe I'm getting uh, accommodations, or maybe I'm getting modifications, or maybe the, the teacher's giving me, instead of five program uh, questions, I'm doing two questions. Then there's a next level of uh, special education support is called the resource specialist, RSP, and that is students in general education program. And there's an, a, a special ed teacher that assists uh, the general ed teacher um, with the curriculum. So 
they break it down, the RSP breaks it down into smaller chunks or focus on if the child is behind in reading and uh, the rest of the general ed participation is great, they can address the reading part of um, the needs. So this is called RSP and it's in addition to the general education placement. So typically the students in a general education placement, resource teacher is an augment that's either a pullout or a push in service around academics. And the next level of least restrictive environment is the special day class. It's either called um, SDC, special day class. Some schools call it self-contained classrooms. But this is where you have a special edu education teacher. You're in a class with that teacher, and there's other students with um, special needs in that class. Then, um, and it could be for, it's for the entire day. And the next level of, of more restrictive is a non-public school placement. So these are schools that every student in the school has an IEP. Uh, sometimes the schools special on, uh, specialize in a particular disability area like uh, autism. So the plus is you have a school, the entire school understands the framework of autism. The not so pluses, they're not going to be any typical peers in that school that your child's going to have appropriate role models or appropriate speech models. So that's the two things to balance. The next uh, more restrictive thing is instruction for home hospital or institution. So if your child is medically fragile, medication resistant seizure disorder, is extremely vulnerable to infections, you would want to have the teacher come to your home or if it's been hospitalized for three months at a time because of surgery or you can actually have special education service delivery in the hospital. And then the most restricted with what we would call residential placement. There are some schools, um, especially kids that have significant mental health needs as well as learning needs that are um, residential schools. The school actually lives on campus. So that's the continuum, um, continuum of placement. So that would be part of the FAPE. Another part of FAPE is what are the related services? So there are uh, designated instructional services in California, and it's any service necessary to help the student benefit from their education program. Related services, which are again part of that FAPE offer, the frequency and duration, and what they are would be part of the IEP on the FAPE offer. They are, it can be speech and language development, remediation, audiology, orientation and mobility, home instruction, home hospital instruction, adapted physical education, physical therapy, occupational therapy, vision services, behavior intervention services, uh, counseling and guidance. Some of these you can see are appropriate for older students, but it's all the framework of the law. Psychological services, counseling or parent counseling and training, nurse services. Again, for, for these students that are medically fragile, they might need a nurse aid to help with um, suctioning and things like that social work services, recreational services. Um, there are low incidence disabilities, such as those with um, vision issues, uh, visually impaired or hearing impaired, uh, interpretation services, and transportation, typically for students in special day class. Okay, so now we're going to look at how preschool special education preschool services are different in terms of the related services from early intervention versus an IEP. So you were getting occupational therapy or physical therapy at home under early intervention or via your insurance. That's happening now. A lot of families can access these therapies through their insurance while they're in a special education program. The, the insurance would either work in their clinic or at home, those related services, they wouldn't necessarily work in the school environment. 
So they look at walking for early intervention. They look at walking, running in the community, control, postural control, um, strength, balance, riding a bike or playing sport, sports or sensory processing for body awareness and um, keeping appropriate space or being able to participate in activities at home and school. For special education, again, it's a narrower um, perspective what does he need to get educational benefit? It's getting to and from school locations. So maybe there's stairs to go up to uh, the playground and your child has difficulty with the physical therapy. You can have physical therapy to address that. Um, balance issues, so can't get up and down without falling. Strength, doesn't have the core strength to sit at um, the table and do tabletop activities. And of course, for fine motor uh, handwriting, can they hold a pen, uh, pencil or a pen? Are they, do they have a appropriate grasp? Uh, can they open their lunch and snack containers? Can they unbutton, unzip their uh, sweaters to hang up? That's part of the special education service delivery. Um, again, for eating at, in, in home, you would use uh, occupational therapy to help with eating and dressing and independent living, uh, gross motor skills, be able to play in the park or activities, be able to do personal hygiene, and meal prep, not necessarily for three-year-old, street safety, um, money skills, social skills, that could all be done under uh, insurance. You know, for special education, it's specifically gross motor skills for participating on the playground in PE. Um, gross motor skills for being able to move from sitting on the rug, standing up and going to the table. Sensory processing skills, body awareness, self-regulation. Are they, do they understand the arm's length? Are they up in someone's face when they wanna talk? Are they always hitting very hard when they just wanna get some uh, student's attention to play? Uh, social interactions, being able to initiate a request, be able to uh, return uh, if, a, if a, a student asks them a question, be able to answer appropriately. And um, speech and language services, how are they different from early intervention and special education? Well, your experience, you know, communicating, expressing needs or wants to the family or peers, words, gesture, sign language, socializing with play at home or in the park or when visiting a friend, being able to pronounce words, um, uh, sounds, develop early developing sounds, we can understand what you're saying, articulation. And if you have uh, their speeding needs or um, for picky eaters or students with swallowing difficulties. What would that look in the classroom? So how to raise your hand, how to get the teacher's attention, turn taking with peers, how to organize, um, how to uh, get ready to um, say a thought or words, what are the, you know, the WH questions, the where, what, when, who, um, being able to work in uh, socialized group, small group, having eye contact, and joint attention, listening to the other person, knowing when you can respond, articulation of creating and producing sounds for uh, phonetic awareness. That's certainly a, a fact applicable in the school setting. We need to be able to understand the student. And again, this is under speech and language services. And as we talked about before, alternative communication strategies, such as uh, PECS, assistive technology, uh, augmentative alternative communication strategies. So behavior intervention services are different. Um, we're at home, you're looking to close those developmental gaps, addressing behaviors that are associated uh, with the disability, you know, stereotypy, um, uh, having to have uh, difficulty with transitions, having to repeat the same thing, still have self-care needs in terms of feeding, dressing, and toileting, uh, communication needs, uh, play, social skills at home in the park, joint attention. This is what behavior can address. It's in the school setting, 
uh, under special education addressing behaviors that interfere with learning. So yes, it could be a stereotypy. It could be an intention. It could be um, the uh, being uh, so structured and uh, not wanting to interrupt your routine. All that we see in special education and could be addressed with behaviors. Uh, of course, safety concern. Uh, if a student wants to elope or walk away or leave or is so frustrated they start hitting themselves or head banging or biting their hand or hitting other students. Um, uh, working with how to be appropriate in the group and ask questions and be reciprocal. Um, those can all be addressed in special education. Related services, again, for behavior intervention services, it's a framework called ABA. They may be offered as part of the IEP. If you're doing behavior, there's something called a behavior support plan um, or behavior intervention plan, both the same things, um, and can include specific um, evidence-based practices. And again, in the end of this um, presentation, in the appendix, we have links to what evidence-based practices are, um, and so you can have um, that information. It's through the Autism National Professional Development Center, um, CAPT, and you'll, you'll see, we'll go through the link. Um, and they, they need to be implemented by a trained educational team. So there will either be um, an ABA, a behaviorist that's uh, teaching the teacher what to do, or there could be, if the child has major significant behavior issues in terms of what we talk about, the aggression, um, the self-injury, um, they may qualify for a specific behavior aid. So remember, it's worth reviewing, right? What is recommended? Why? To address what need? How? What is the goal that's going to address that need? What will that service look like? Who's going to do it? How often and where will it be provided? And when will it start? How will I know it's really making a difference? It's effective. And then once you, you would make progress, child would gain some skills, and then you would write a goal for that next level of um, learning based on what the child just learned. Okay, I see that there's a couple of questions here, so I'm gonna go look at the questions. In case my child will reach her goals written in the IEP sooner than the next IEP meeting, is it possible to have the next IEP meeting sooner, earlier? Yes. Okay, so I guess I am answering why. <laughs> yes. So if your child meets their IEP goals, then you talk with the teacher, you can have amendment IEP specifically just to write the goals that they've already addressed. So, and this again, this would be if you just have your IEP, you wrote goals in three months, the student has blown everybody away because she's met all her goals, then you can come, you don't have to have the whole team, you can do it just with the teacher or just with the speech person, the goals that she, um, she met and write new goals, and that could be an amendment to the IEP, okay? Um, do public schools, do all public schools accept students with special needs IEP? Do we need to go through permit application if we would like to choose other schools than our local one? Okay, so in this situation, it, the, it's where you live is the school district that you're communicating with. If the school district programs that they're offering you are not appropriate for your child, you can document how they're not appropriate for your child, then you would use the due process piece to uh, change schools or to access another school or program that would meet the child's needs. So it, it can't be, I don't like this school because it's in such and such an area. That is not an appropriate um, reason to change schools. You have to talk about how this program is not specifically appropriate for your child. And you use the IEP meeting and then they can um, address another uh, uh, 
talk about it and uh, offer or address that need through offering another program. So I'm going to go back to questions now, questions to ask about your preschool class. So things to consider, what is the makeup of the children in the class? Are they, are they mostly typically developing children or do they have special needs? Are they their, your same child's age? Um, so this is a toughie, especially if your children, uh, your child is um, nonverbal. So we, would it be appropriate to be with other children in the class who are nonverbal so that there's no um, speech models there, we're not hearing any speech models, we're not being able to practice our speech with another peer because nobody in that class is uh, speaking. So that's something to consider. A way that some districts address that, if that's their main uh, special needs program, then you can have systematic integration with non-disabled peers um, every day for a half hour, hour a day, and then that way with support, and then that way your students' um, needs can get met because they're hearing and they're having that opportunity to practice speech and hearing speech. Okay. Age appropriate. Typically, more uh, uh, preschool classes are within uh, a year. So you for three-year-olds, you could have three or four-year-olds. Some instances, five years old. Five, you wouldn't have K. So you, um, special day classes usually have students with a, a year spread. So the, the K would do a K in first grade. Okay. The school district um, typically provides transportation if you're in a special day class. However, if you're attending the, your, your school, your neighborhood school, then transportation typically is not provided. You want to ask how many hours per day, how many days a week, is there summer school? That's all part of your questions that you would need to know. And typically you don't pay for any part of your child's special education. Look at the, the play area. Is it safe? Is it fenced? Is, it, uh, is there a special area for K and preschool versus the larger play yard equipment? Is going to be supervision uh, on the play equipment? Um, the supervision will also look, are there the children uh, rough or active or, or older? You know, those are all things to, to look at, which you can ask questions and what makes a, a program appropriate. Okay. Uh, will staff work on toilet training? So if your child is not toilet trained, then some special day classes, that's very familiar. And some general ed classes, unfortunately, I think the student needs to have uh, toilet training unless that's part of the, the classroom curriculum. Is there an atmosphere in the classroom? Is there a happy, relaxed feeling? Are the, are the children kind of uh, busy? Are they all engaged in, in learning activities? If they're not working with the teacher, typically there would be different center areas that they would be participating in with maybe an adult kind of supervising those, those areas. Does the spa staff who speak to children, are they talking with uh, caring and respect? Um, using people first language, respecting the student as a, a person. <laughs> is the classroom organized and clean and have interesting toys? These are all things to consider. When can you visit? However, uh, when can I visit whenever I want to? Typically not. You would have to make arrangements. When can you volunteer in the class? Are, are parent meetings? How do you communicate with the teacher? These are all things to ask a preschool. So if your child has a special diet or food, uh, uh, requires medicine or a special diet, how will that be delivered? Is that something I bring? If your child has allergies, nut allergies, dairy allergies, how, how, where will they be seated so that they would uh, receive, um, you know, not have that exposure? And is the curriculum the same for all um, of the students? Um, um, is it differentiated in instruction? So, um, and how much time is spent in instruction ver unstructured versus unstructured activities? So I wanted to take this time to talk to you about Westside's Education Support Services. We provide help 
uh, assist with getting and pursuing a free and appropriate public education with our expertise in inclusive special education services. We consult with uh, WRC staff, school personnel, we can make visits and we attend your IEP, we can review documents and assessments, um, and um, we provide uh, an IEP support group and other training opportunities. So there's three of us in our department. I'm Barbara Marbach, I'm the team leader. And I'm actually just gonna take a minute to tell you how I got into this work. I got into this work because I have a son, he's an adult now, but had significant um, medication uh, needs. He had a medication resistant seizure disorder and cerebral palsy, was nonverbal. He had a respiratory arrest um, uh, through a seizure when he was um, eight months old that, that caused pretty significant damage. So nonverbal and intellectual disability, uh, cerebral palsy, and still seizures. So um, uh, it was a very rough, rough road, and there wasn't a lot of information out there. He was born in 77, so the uh, idea was only in place in 1975, became adapt adapted as a federal law in 1975. So uh, here I had uh, a son with really significant issues and uh, nobody really um, was familiar with supporting the students with such significant issues. So I really kind of learned through the school of hard knocks and um, then was hired uh, as a, a three-month contract on Westside to do IEP uh, trainings and groups and support families. And uh, that was so successful that I got hired um, as a full-time um, education advocacy specialist in the early 90s at Westside. And since then, we've really grown as a company. And we have um, Ron Lopez, who's... Um, uh, a specialist is um, high expertise, been doing this for many years with, with early intervention as well as older students and he's our, our Spanish speaking rep and then Fabian uh, also has uh, years of expertise in supporting families with IEPs and she speaks English and American. This is your team and again we have the IEP uh, support group and we're available to you if you call. Okay, so question. Let's go to question. Mm -hmm. um, there was a question, Barbara, and it's uh, way earlier on. It said, where can we find examples of goals that are age appropriate? We can find examples of goals. So there's a great resource. Um, it's called uh, California Disability Rights. And they have a document called the Special Education SUR, Special Education Rights and Responsibility Manual. And that would be um, a, a great uh, resource in terms of idea. Also, you can ask your providers that you're transitioning from uh, to give you an idea of a draft goal. Um, yes, they're not a special education people, but they've been working with your students in speech and OT, um, and you can ask them for uh, what would you recommend that I uh, request as a goal. So that, that would be also an, uh, an area. Because goals are individualized for your students' needs, it's, there's not necessarily a place where you can, uh, 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 unless you want to search the internet, but the idea is, <laughs> your child's very individualized. So based on what's happening with them via the assessment information is you can develop goals. You can also talk to us and, and uh, our department and we can help you as well. Barb, I just wanted to add on that. Um, Go ahead. The, um, the goals should be developmentally appropriate versus age appropriate. Because if we're looking the age first, then we're not going to truly address the development of the child. So based on the assessments that we're going to get, the goals will get created uh, using the information that was found in, in the, um, uh, with the assessments and we'll develop based on the goals based on the child's developmental stage. 
That's that's right. <laughs> they they certainly will. So it's uh, developmentally, but also in my son's case, right? Developmentally, he was very very you know, say K level, first grade level. But when we were in high school, even though cognitively we were that level, we wanted to put goals in the context that would be appropriate for his age. Right. So that's, those are the two things to consider, right? It wouldn't be appropriate for him to be, you know, working with uh, uh, K materials, but if he was learning basic sight words, he could be working with um, magazines of interest that had pictures that are age appropriate. So that's that's an example of how to do that. Okay. So are there any other questions? No. Okay. So I'm moving on. Oh, and we're going to turn turn the show over to Fabin. She's one of our education advocacy specialists, and she's been doing a lot of prep work around what's happening now with COVID. So uh, that was a lot of information, great information from uh, Barbara, a lot of uh, years of uh, expertise. And um, all of that is good information, but now we're um, in COVID world and uh, things are a little different. Um, generally with the law, there's no directives in terms of um, you know, uh, what should happen when schools closed for extensive uh, period of time. Um, however, there's no change in the law as it exists right now. So um, in reality, your, uh, your uh, local education agency, your school district should be providing um, services as long as um, w uh, for students with disabilities for as long as the general education continues to be provided. Okay. Okay. I have no control. <laughs> I'm trying to do it. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Okay. Where do we go further? Okay. More? Next? Uh, do you see some? Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So, um, for COVID, you know, uh, and, and nowadays that we are social distancing, so how does that really work? So um, the transition meetings are obviously taking uh, place virtually. However, it's, uh, it's very difficult to conduct assessments virtually without uh, having um, physical contact with, uh, with the kids. So um, districts are now accepting provider information such as regional center reports or you know if there are any assessments done by a medical team, they're able to um, take a look at those, um, that information and be able to provide services. Oh, that's okay. So if your child uh, remains eligible uh, with the regional, uh, for services with um, the regional center under the Lanterman Act, um, regional, Westside is uh, working with the local district to continue to provide services, service delivery in, on a case-by-case -case situations. Um, so um, if you're a Westside family, you know, um, uh, expect that support. Um, however, the family must document um, all the stuff that's going on with the school district, the communication that you're having, the answers that you're getting, you document, it's very important to uh, continue to um, have uh, documentation to support, um, you know, requests at a later date. So if your child is not going to be eligible for regional center services under the Lanterman Act, uh, the Family Resource Center would be supporting um, your child. Um, they have um, a grant that allows them to work with families on education, and they're um, great uh, sources of support. However, you must uh, continue to document on your part what's going on uh, with the school district and uh, the communication that you're having with the district. Uh, so yes, document, document, document. Uh, we've provided you with a link um, that um, uh, has a, the sample a sample letter that you can um, uh, use to um, uh, 
you know, to send for, to the school district that allows you to document the timeline when assessments can be conduct, conducted, um, compensatory services can be considered from the date when the child turns three. Uh, the sample letter is provided in the link. These are uncertain times, so um, it's uh, distant learning is likely to continue to um, uh, be with us for a while. Uh, we don't have a, you know, a date that um, the kids are going to go uh, back to school. So um, that means that parents are expected uh, to assist. Um, that includes redirection, supervising, facilitating participation. So there's going to be a lot that's going to be expected from your part or an adult in your home to be able to support your child. So um, like I said earlier, the, there's no uh, change in the law. The law re remains the same. So your child is um, uh, eligible, entitled for a uh, fee an appro appropriate and uh, appropriate public education. Um, so the free, the free part is um, at no cost to you, uh, simply um, self-explanatory. And uh, the appropriate part is the one that's going to be significantly affected. Um, like I said earlier, assessments are not gonna be able to be done in person. So in um, doing them virtually, it's very difficult. It's not gonna be accurate. So um, start documenting things. So, uh, and, uh, uh, so um, um, even though we're, they're not able, the, the school district is not able to assess the children, they are uh, by law um, supposed to offer services. However, if they don't have information, so uh, you know, to on how to proceed with this uh, in terms of where the child is at, they're not going to be able to do uh, appropriate placement, appropriate assessment, or appropriate goals. So um, once um, school resumes and we go back to the normal and we figure out a way to assess children and once the child is uh, found eligible, then we can um, take that documentation and uh, request for compensatory education. <laughs> what happened? Uh, hold on, let me see. Okay. So, what is cons compensatory education? This happens when your um, uh, your district hasn't uh, provide your child with the appropriate education. Compensatory education is um defined as a justifiable form of compensation when a school district does not provide a free and appropriate public education. Um, so documenting and making sure that uh, uh, your child hasn't been getting these services uh, would help you later on uh, once the, find, the, the child is found eligible for a certain service to go back and say, you know, uh, had the child been assessed on a timely basis, um, then the child would have qualified for these services and would have been getting these services. So, um, you know, he, uh, he or she will need um, to have some compensatory education so they can catch up those hours. So um, documentation is very important. You make sure that you uh, put in writing uh, what the child is getting and is not getting on a daily basis. So there are two ways that compensatory education can take place. Um, uh, one is uh, the hours missed. So if your child is, you know, found eligible for an hour of speech, but they haven't gotten the services due to COVID, not being able, the, the school district not being able to access. Uh, assess the child to provide that service, then we can go back and ask, you know, uh, he has, he should have been getting um, this service for this long, but not, didn't get it. So we can calculate the hours and request for those hours to be made up. Um, the other way that um, the child can get uh, some compensatory education is if the family decide, well, we can't wait for reassessment, we're just gonna um, go ahead and uh, 
fund it ourselves and get the child services. In that way, then we can go back and say, well, this is the service that should have been provided by the school district. Um, however, because of a lack of assessments and not being able to provide the services, the child didn't receive it from the school district. However, the parents did pay for it so we can ask for reimbursement. Those are the two ways that um, the child can get um, compensatory education. So with that, any questions? Let's take questions. Sandy, do you have questions? Do I... oh, uh, no questions on my part. Uh, just a reminder for everyone to click on the Q&A box on your screen and submit any questions at this time. Okay, so we're going back here. Okay, and Fabian, just, you can bounce in, right? I don't right. have to turn it. Yes. Okay. Therapy services. So we talked about this in terms of the difference between insurance funded clinical services based on medical model or what they receive from the school district. So how do you obtain services in the medical model? You would get talk to your primary care physician, psychologist. Um, they might be able to send a letter based on observed diagnosis of special education. I wish you guys were here in person because I would ask you this question because we went over it, right? <laughs> so your child's teacher or other involved person can ask the IEP team for an assessment, right? We talked about assessments to determine the need for therapy. So how do we know how much service in a special education the therapist would recommend um, the child's education based on the child's ed educational needs how much therapy is, is warranted. And remember, it's, um, it's uh, uh, language-based, it's uh, social, it's a, in a classroom. So it's gonna look different than a direct for the medical model. So uh, what that, that would be part of what your physician would write or the psychologist would recommend and it would be written in um, a plan for treatment that your um, insurance company would agree to. Therapy model. You want to take this one, Faden? Sure. So um, uh, usually the medical model will take place at a clinic or at home or in the community, um, whereas the education model would um, take place on school grounds, like playgrounds for social skills maybe, or speech therapy or cafeteria classrooms or even at the clinic. Um, who, uh, the medical model is paid for the insurance company that can include Medi-Cal or um, if the insurance company um, does not cover the therapy and can give you um, a, a letter declining the service, then maybe you, uh, you can access regional center or you can privately pay. Um, however, for special education, the school district is supposed to be um, is supposed to pay for um, your child's education. There would be nothing out of pocket for you. Mm -hmm. The other thing I wanted to add in terms of the school, the special education, you mentioned clinics. There are some school districts that have an OT clinic, an OT room clinic right. where the, the student goes or might even be um, driven to um, uh, by the district as part of their class time. So, right. Medical model therapy services. So can services ever be changed? Well, it's a, you talk with your doctor, they change the orders, they share it with the insurance company, and then there you go. <laughs> and special education service requirement, you have to have an IEP meeting to actually change the services uh, and the, the duration or the frequency. And that would be a recommendation from the therapist. They would probably share a report. Again, we talked about how important it is to get reports ahead of time that you can get familiar. And then at the meeting, you would discuss the proposed change. The cutoff age, there's no, my understanding, there's no cutoff age for medically necessary therapy or funding of therapy for school as we talked before. 
if either age 22 if you're on the alternative curriculum or age 18 if you're on the core curriculum and you receive your diploma. Just want to add something real quick on the um, on on the uh, things that can be changed. Um, make sure that you do sign your IEP on a timely basis to make sure that the changes you put in place will take place. If the IEP is not signed, then um, the changes will not take effect. I know we say that often, but it's amazing how many families don't sign their IEP and they think like, oh yeah, I like it. But no, you need the signature. So I mentioned a little bit about this in terms of the evidence-based practices. This, and I would highly recommend families to check out this link here. We have wealth of information. There's new information around social skills to help the students understand the framework of COVID, what's been going on, why their life is so different. So there's some great resources here. Then as you can see, there's Spanish and English versions. So um, uh, Cal uh, the captain is California Autism Professional Training Alliance and Information Network. So it's a state level um, support all around addressing the needs um, with individuals with autism. Um, they have resources for home learning, resources for distant learning, um, and different apps. So I highly recommend uh, you take the time to check that. Some of the information is what we call is in this um, autism internet modules and it actually, this is what you want to learn. These are the strategies to learn it and, and, and um, will actually teach you how teachers would address this need. You have to log in um, and create your own account, but it, it's free and, it, and it's worth doing if you're just starting on your educational career with your three-year-old. These are some of the evidence-based practices that uh, are addressed. So the other thing we talked about for the three to five-year-olds is the assessment model that they use, and this is the desired results developmental profile. Um, these are the uh, adaptations to look at in terms of, um, these are the areas that the desired results look, looks at self-concept, social and personal skills, self-regulation, language, learning, cognitive competence, math skills, literacy skills, motor skills, and health and safety. And there are some adaptations. So this is uh, augmentative uh, communication. This is an example of a switch system. Um, and again, I explain now more, more and more three-year-olds, four-year-olds are familiar with screens or with tablets. Now there's, there's a lot of this information uh, in terms of uh, if the child has the fine motor skills to hit an icon on the tablet, that can work. If they're still developing skills and we have things called switches, which is like a Big Mac switch, which is more of a uh, situation like that. So that's... Do you want to... Um, See that we have another question. Okay, so someone's asking where to find these, and I think Sandy can talk about that when we're done and we go to the next uh, question uh, segment. So another uh, audience, this is for a, a kiddo with um, vision impairment, and so you can see that there's a. Um, uh, an accommodation or a modification of a, um, a panel over the keyboard so the student can only hit certain keys. They can't hold a pencil or manipulate, they can either push that or this is a, a template over the keyboard. So adjustments for uh, vision issues, vision support. You can see this is an example of a lighted background with large, large letters and numbers. So that's an appropriate uh, accommodation if that's the child's needs. Uh, assistive equipment, you can notice that she's got um, uh, scissors with a loop hand, a loop, a loop at the end so they don't have to be open right away. Some places have left-handed um, scissors, so it's easier for the student to participate. And again, the area of need in terms of if you've got really limited uh, motor um, ability, 
where you position the students so they can access the materials and use the parts of their body that they, they, they can use is, is critical too. And you would think um, most people in a special ed classroom would be aware of this and do this. So if you're observing the classroom and you see students with more significant needs or motor needs, and they're not able to access the materials, then that would be a flag that maybe it's not an appropriate classroom for their students. Okay, increasing and decreasing sensory input. So this is kind of a part of um, sensory integration that might take place in an OT room or an OT clinic, and it's the rocking back and forth that helps um, um, uh, mediate that uh, sensory difficulty. So also a recognition that a child might demonstrate mastery of a skill in a way that's, that's unique in terms of how they would communicate. So maybe she's leaning or pointing to a question. Maybe she needs to look away because eye contact is still difficult, but she still can produce the right answer. So we need to look at and understand what alternative responses would be. Okay. Okay, I think we're turning it over to Sandy. And just to remind everyone that we do have a resource page, as you see in your screen. So if you go to westsiderc.org and you click on our resources, you will have resources um, specifically for infants and for those all the way up to age five. We also have other types of resources. Um, if you're being affected by COVID-19, we do have a specific resource page. If you go on the front of our website, you'll see a icon that says to click for COVID-19 and you can read everything that you need, like financial, maybe distance learning, anything like that. We do have our Facebook page, an Instagram page as well. So look for us, um, just type Westside Regional Center. And we also have our YouTube channel. Uh, if you just search for Westside Regional Center and you'll be able to find the videos there once they get posted. Okay, uh, I don't see any questions. Um, any closing remarks, Barbara? Well, um... I, I hope this was not too much information and that it's uh, it's available to you. Okay, so yeah, we got the, the support group. Um, we're here, you've got our phone numbers. We're here at Westside. This education support services is very unique to Westside Regional Center. We're the only regional center that has a dedicated depart a department to assist families with the IEP process. We work with um, this age, uh, folks transitioning in all the way through the other transition of folks transitioning out, which is uh, as complicated as this. And um, we've had trainings on that in the past as well, and there'll be still times coming up. So uh, thank you for the opportunity and hang in there. And Fabian, is there anything else you would like to say for closing? Um, no, just uh, lean on us if you need your uh, help, our assistance, uh, email us, call us, we're available to help. Okay, well, thank you everyone. I'll go ahead. <laughs> I was say, it's just, it's, it's a new different world with the remote learning. My understanding is that uh, um, there was a focus that maybe in late August we, we would be attending classes. I think that's very questionable that the remote and distant learning will might be going on until um, November. So this is um, something that's, that's, that's a, 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 a stress for everybody, but it doesn't mean that you can't access your service or access your speech or your OT. It just will, will look a little different. So, uh, we're, and we're here to help. And thanks again, Sandy, for, and Rhianne mm -hmm. for pulling this all together. Yes, thank you, team. Mm -hmm. Well, at this time, our webinar is over. So thank you for joining us and allowing us into your homes, your office, or wherever you're at, and really ha hope that you have a really great day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.